on paper or are you all digital? I do. I do. Well, it's, you know, it's, I think like you, it's a, uh, it's a fusion. Um, I do all the drawing traditionally, but all the color and, and kind of the, the not post-production, it's still production, but uh, do all the, all the color digitally. I haven't actually, um, I'm trying to think for print if when's the last time I used analog materials for color. It's been yeah. a while. Um, but I still do all the drawing the old fashioned way. I, I think, uh, I mean, this is such an obnoxious thing to talk about. But like, you, do you draw with pencil and then do you coloring, do you scan in just the pencils? Well, I do. I, it depends. I, there, there are two different methods by which I uh, work, depending on what kind of look I want. And if I'm going more painterly, yeah, I do really uh, detailed, well, not detailed, but, but fully rendered. Uh, pencil drawings, scan those in, and then it, the digital color is more painterly. Um, and, but for, you know, most of the comics, it's just pe typical pen and ink uh, with flatter color. Yeah, I'll show you some of the, like I'll do like that, like I'll just scan in the drawing and then I'll just do something like this underneath this. This is just a layer, color layer. Yeah, I've got, I, I should keep my box next to me, but yeah, I've, I, I've gotten into this thing with, the, with uh, the, the book that I just finished, the Dottie's Inferno uh, stuff of kind of creating fake halftones um, where I do all the, this one layer of shading uh, just with colored pencil, mm -hmm. scan that in, uh, but it's got the gradations of tone and all that. And then I really distress it. So it's almost like an old newsprint kind of oh. halftone and just lay that in as one of the color layers, so. Yeah, I just got a book um, in the mail from this artist. I, I won't say who it is, but he's like one of those guys who's like really into making his work look like a, a like something you see in the Smithsonian book mm. comics where they, you, he's trying really hard to trick you about like how old the comic is. Yeah. That you're looking at, yeah. which is really cool, but the problem is that like, he's not a good, he doesn't really have anything to say so I'm like, I'm, I was like trying to read this book last night and I'm just like, this is like the most boring, like it's like visually so stunning and beautiful, but like I'm getting like nothing out of this. Like there's no story, there's like no meat to it. So right. lately I've been really valuing like storytellers in comics over just uh, kind of like artsy stuff. Like I, like I, those are the things I'm trying to like fill my bookshelf with like the stuff that like has real heft to it, you know, that I remember reading, uh, like for example, I've been like really into this. I don't know if you read this or not. The, mm. But like- I've I just, read some of it. I mean, I never read that big compendium, but I've read some of the, some of the pieces in it. Yeah. Well, I, writing, I mean, for me, writing has always been as important, if not more important. Um, and uh, I'm not saying it, I was always uh, great at it, I would be arrogant to say I've ever gotten great at it, but uh, it's it's at least an important factor. But yeah, if I when I look at the stuff from the early part of my career, it was definitely that kind of thing where it's almost writing page to page as opposed to blocking out your entire vision of where you want things this thing to go. Right. Um, there's you know there's something sort of fun about not having that roadmap because then every page you're like one of my all-time favorite books was, um, and still is, uh, Mobius's uh, The Airtight Garage of oh, yeah. Jerry Cornelius. Uh -huh. And that thing clearly was written page to page. You know, the styles would change from chapter to chapter. And that was part of what was so exciting. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, among other things, I was first exposed to that when it was first being serialized in heavy metal. Mm -hmm. And it was doled out in such short chapters. You know, you get two pages in one, maybe six in another. Then, you know, it was spread out over years and you never knew what you were going to get and there was something really exciting because for me of course as a kid when it was coming out there was this sense that he was doing it as I was like so between each issue he was working on the next one I didn't really have that concept that this was all work that was just being translated and you know yeah you kind of you figure that out a little a, bit did he have like a structure in his head you think of like I don't think he did. I really don't. And I think that was really the joy of that one particular project. Did he was stick that the it was, Sorry? Did he stick the landing in the end? Did it, work, did it actually work out? I think that's up, really up to the reader. Um, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, it, it was a very, I guess you could, you could charitably say a very oblique ending. Um, mm -hmm. 
but it worked. You know, it, it, it was the kind of thing where it felt very elliptical. And sometimes that can feel like a cheat where you're like, okay, this person did not hand it. So it's one of these things where it's, the, it's just a, a continuous cycle. This story will happen uh, ad infinitum. But for that one, which was so organically weird and had so many different kinds of genre bashing in it, you know, this chapter looks like a Western. That one is hard sci-fi. This one is space opera. I was okay with the fact that I think it ended with the main character shaving off his mustache, dressing in regular clothes and getting on a subway train. It was like, okay, <laughs> you know? Let me show you, I actually, it's funny you were talking about this. I just got this on eBay. You probably already have this, but it's this uh, heavy metal. Oh yeah, that was, I got that when it came out, yeah. If, yeah. I mean, I've got, I think, three and a half shelves of just Mobius, so oh, it's, uh, yeah, that's, what, what were you doing? Uh, not creator owned stuff at Dark Horse, were you? Yeah, yeah, it was almost all creator owned. I think. I mean, I did a couple of uh, writing projects for them, where I, I wrote one uh, mask series for them. Okay, yeah. And um, you do Aliens versus Predator. I didn't do that. I, I did the the comic book tie in to. You remember the movie Mystery Men? Yeah, uh, the of course. Ben Stiller thing. Yeah, yeah. I wrote the. I didn't draw, but I wrote the adaptation. Uh, which was based on the screenplay. So it actually bears very little resemblance <laughs> to the movie because it's one of those things where it's like, when I saw the movie, I thought, oh, I did, none of this is in my comic. I, I will say the movie was better than, than the uh, script that I worked from. But that was, those are the kind of gigs that I would love when they would fall in my lap because they were incredibly rushed, mm -hmm. which made them very well paying. You know, it was like the page rate was the same as any other writing rate, mm -hmm. but you had to do it in like, a weekend so it's like okay i made you know four grand this weekend oh yeah <laughs> it's a good weekend you know it's uh yeah and then your I, wife is happy with you for that weekend yeah, yeah exactly yeah good. and then it's feast or famine though right does that ever go away no. <laughs> it's always like that right you'll, yeah. you'll get a really good gig yeah, pretty much yeah yeah yeah, I, I don't care about posthumous uh, anything. Like when I'm dead, they can throw all my shit in a bonfire. I'd kind of like it now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, you don't think about that? Like how, like how people are going to, like what your legacy is going to be? I really don't very often. I, I you know, I guess in, in, in some way it would be nice that your work survives you. Uh, and I say that because so many of the people whose work I revere are in the bone orchard. So, you know, obviously I'm glad that, uh, but I, I don't really think about legacy very much. You know, I, I, I'm trying to do the best I can while I'm here. Mm. Hopefully will people in, will enjoy it or even find it while I'm here. Yeah. But when I'm gone, I don't know. I don't well, know. if you, if you were a casualty of 2020, God forbid, what would be the work that, <laughs> that people would remember, like what would be the image people would be posting on Facebook? <laughs> well, you know it's never gonna be what you want it to be. <laughs> no. It's probably gonna be some story I did for Cracked when I was 20, you know? It would be the stuff <laughs> for like nuts, you know? <laughs> Worse, you know, it'll be like something I did for, for one of the men's magazines, you know? It's like, I mean, oh, I no, certainly- you did, you did a lot of the sex comics, didn't you? I toiled in the gutter for many years. Speaking of sweet paying gigs, you know, there. Oh, really? That was good? Oh my God. I didn't do that stuff for the joy of it. It was really <laughs> lucrative. Um, when I think of, you know, when I think about, I mean, any, anything like that, it was cutting, you know, you're cutting your teeth. It's getting good work habits. Mm -hmm. But I can't say I look at that work with, with much pride. But yeah. it, it definitely, you know, there. How do you talk about this kind of stuff without seeming completely crass? I mean, it was it was it was easy money, and it was it was there was a time when you know when print men's magazines were a really viable market, and yeah. you know if you were like I say, if you're willing to swim in the sewer and you had some chops, mm -hmm. you know the well, best money best I will say the best consistent money I ever made was working for those magazines. You did what, Penthouse, and did you do Screw? I worked, well, Screw is like, that's the bottom of the barrel. I mean, oh, really? you know, <laughs> basically, they paid lousy, but they also didn't have very, you know, high uh, standards, so you could really bash it out. 
I actually made better money writing for them than I did drawing for them. I wrote a column for them for a while. Oh, oh I didn't know that. Um, wow. Which, you know, again, it's one of those things I'll sort of hang my head in, sh in shame because Screw did have a house style mm -hmm. and their house style was being kind of mean, you know? So if you were going to uh, write, I wrote a review column for them. I, I wrote a, uh, a column reviewing adult comics. Oh, Talk about having a foot in both ponds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I wrote some stuff that when I, I well, not that I've reread it, but when I think about it, uh, I think, wow, I was, re <laughs> I would, I was really mean. I would not want to be on the receiving end of one of those reviews. Now, granted, most of the stuff I was reviewing, uh, reviewing was horrible. Yeah. But, you know, there's, there's, there's a line, and they really wanted snappy and snarky and it was a very easy voice to write in so you did know. you wreck any relationships with fellow artists doing that kind of stuff i thought i might have i actually there was somebody who i had reviewed very unkindly um and when i first met her she clearly had read the review hmm. and was not happy i think it was literally the first san diego comic-con i went to and you know got confronted at a uh, one of the parties by this person. And, you know, I didn't apologize. I was just kind of the person came over to me and said, so you really don't like my comic. And I was just kind of like, no, I didn't. And it was, you know, there was no joy in that exchange. It was very awkward and there were no winners <laughs> on that yeah. battlefield. Yeah. Um, but years later, you know, I, I apologized. It was almost one of those things where like, you know, where uh, when you're in Alcoholics Anonymous and you start going up to people and making your apologies to like, I'm sorry, I, was, I peed on your rug, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I apologized and I believe that person when she said, I didn't even remember that. Oh shit, you I, just opened a wound. I didn't really start doing like solo type stuff um, that I would really, be very uh, happy with until trying to think when White Like She came out. Uh, that would be 93, 94, I think. Mm -hmm. But I'd already been working for 10 years at that point. Uh, White Like She was your first book? Your first that graphic? was the first, yeah, that was actually, and that was Dark Horse. That was the oh. first, that was the first graphic novel. I mean, I'd done short stuff before that mm -hmm. for like heavy metal and uh, for Dark Horse, I was, you know, I would do stuff for their anthologies and that kind of thing. So what do you think of White Like She when you go back and read it now? I have very mixed feelings. Hmm. Um, I hate the art. You should, not, I guess you should never admit these things, like, but whatever. Uh, yeah, and, and, and artists have no, I mean, you can talk shit about your own stuff, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't it's, look like your work now. That's, that's the thing, it doesn't, that's why, I, hate is a strong word. I, I really am, I'm a little too liberal with with using the word hate. Um, but it, it's, it's not work that I enjoy looking at. That would be a better way of putting it. Cause I look at it and I can say it's perfectly uh, competent. You know, mm -hmm. I don't look at it and say it's terrible, but I also don't feel me. Like I was definitely trying for something. I think in hopes of, I don't know. It's like when, you know, comedians appear in dramas because they want to be taken seriously. I think because I'd only ever really worked for Cracked and I wanted to be taken seriously. So I went very, you know, whatever. Yeah. You know what I want to see that you did that I never, I, I didn't know that you, you did something about like Ran Xerox, that like Italian. Uh, Where that is that stuff? Where can I see that? Is that online yeah. anywhere? No, you really can't. That's how I began my career. Um, Ranks Rocks was coming out in heavy metal. I loved it. Mm -hmm. And I was in Harvey Kurtzman's class at that time at, at in SBA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's weird actually, because I was just doing some pleasure reading today, just to go on a little digression. And I was reading some uh, Dan Klaus and some Peter Bagg. And I was reading Bagg's, uh, I already forgot the name of the collection, but it's sort of his is loose end stuff, stuff that was from the hate annuals and all that. And it has a bunch of things where he wrote them and other people drew them. Mm -hmm. And there's a, uh, an autobiographical piece in there about his one meeting with Harvey Kurtzman uh, <laughs> that Danny Hellman did the art for. And uh, I'm going to have to talk to Pete about that one. I, can't, um, I, I read that book. I don't remember that, that story though. What happens? It's just him coming. It's, it's, again, it's a weird thing to read. Uh, uh, 
because that would be when I was going to SVA. When that story takes place, it's 1983, and that was the year I was in Harvey's class. Yeah. So that's the Harvey that I knew. And um, it's a story where he's coming, Pete's coming in with his portfolio to uh, see about contributing to this new anthology Harvey was editing called Nuts, oh. <laughs> which was my very first gig. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just kind of a weird thing to read that strip because I don't usually have that much skin in the game for other people's autobiographical things. Mm. Um, but yeah, but the but the Ranks Rock spoof that I did was just for, you know, my own extracurricular uh, entertainment. And of course, I look at it now and it's it's got a lot of energy. I was 19 years old. I mean, I was, you know, but it it's it's not it doesn't fulfill the obligation of of parody because really all I did was amp up, you know, Ranks Rocks was already a pervy, violent strip. So all I did was make mine even pervier and more violent. Yeah. which isn't parody that's you know it should have been if anything rank strikes should have been super Not gentle yeah, and, yeah, you know, yeah very sweet and maybe everything around him is horrible and monstrous there you go yeah but you know whatever i was 19 and i really just wanted to be shocking you know i was reading all the undergrounds but maybe i was right because through some channels a photocopy of that strip got into Tonino Liberatore's hands. Hmm. He loved it. He showed it to his publisher. The publisher then basically came to New York. I mean, he was there for other business and offered me a book contract to do an entire album of those Wanksarok strips. Wow. And so of course I'm 19 years old and I dropped out of SBA, you know, it was like, okay, I'm done. I've got a book contract with a European publisher. You know, I, I, See you clowns later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, things again, they don't shake out the way you think they're going to. I, I th I'm trying to think how many of those I did. I didn't fulfill the, the book contract. You um, didn't? You didn't actually do the book? No, because the, the thing about the pre internet world is dealing with doing an international uh, work arrangement mm -hmm. was A, so unmanageable. And B, through a series of kind of, I don't know what you'd call them, misfirings, I, these strips would appear because they were supposed to be serialized in, in this one magazine before being collected as a book. Yeah. And that magazine went belly up. Uh, and then it was trying to find a home for it in other magazines. So they came out really piecemeal and it would take me sometimes months, half a year to get paid. Oh, yeah. And at a certain point, I was just like, fuck this. I'm not, I, I, I'm not going to do this anymore. You know, it was not even arrogance. It was just exasperation. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the relationship with me and that publisher really soured, um, par, you know, partly because I was being churlish and, you know, and so forth. And anyway, I mean, everything, like, all, fortunately, all of those fires were put out a long time ago and he and I are on on fine terms now but it took about 20 years to repair those you know that relationship but the book but the book never came out I think they ran in maybe five or five or six different magazines each one individually it was like uh -huh. so it was it was tracking them down would be hard I can't even name the magazines that they were all in one was a what weekly is? version of L'Eco de Savan called L'Ebdo de Savan, which was more tabloid style. Yeah. And I think one of them ran in a Spanish magazine called El Vibora. And then a couple ran in a thing called Special USA. And then there were a couple of other magazines that I just don't even remember. Are you, uh, were you raised religious at all or not? I was not. I was not. So for me, you know, it's it's all about kind of enjoying the concepts of things but uh yeah I was not I wasn't raised with with any religion so well I was uh raised in Arizona so I know hell is real <laughs> yeah um I want to talk about uh Harvey Kurtzman's class when you were in there were there any cartoonists uh, that your classmates that are still working no I here's here's where I'm probably going to sound awful mm -hmm. uh I can barely remember who was in my class. Um, 
the you know my my best friend was I met him at SBA, and uh, he worked for many years. Um, not really as a cartoonist though. He was more of an illustrator um, and caricaturist. Hmm. Uh, but he's kind of um, retreated a little bit from that. I mean, he still keeps a hand in, but the, my, yeah, mine was not one of those years where, you know, you hear about those kind of legendary classes that Kurtzman had that had Drew Friedman and yeah, Kaz and Kaz and J.D. King and, you know, all those kind of, you know, the, the early 80s, uh, John Holmstrom, all that yeah. kind of. But I mean, Kurtzman's class was kind of baffling to me um, because I didn't even read the description. It was just like I saw Kurtzman taught at SBA and uh, that was enough. I was like, okay, I'm going. Hmm. Um, but I just assumed because he did such great comics that he taught comics and he yeah. didn't teach comics. Really? So yeah, he taught uh, gag panels like New Yorker style single panel gags. He never, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know if he's ever even, had ever even done a gag cartoon. Yeah, yeah, I can't think of any. I'm sorry if you hear my dog's oh, okay. in the background. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so it was baffling. So I was, I was not what you would call an exemplary student because I was not, I never intended to be a gag cartoonist. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really very alienated by his curriculum. Do you remember so, any of it, what it was like? Like the, the kinds of assignments that you would have gotten and stuff? It, you know, I mean, for one thing, he would always bring in like a bunch of stuff for us to look at. Like it was, here's a bunch of, you know, issues of, of, of Fluid Glacial or yeah. Leco de Savan, or you'd bring, he'd bring in European comics, basically saying, this is what good comics look like. American comics aren't any good. And it's like, okay, I'm with you so far. Um, <laughs> You know, most of the students in the class had no interest in any of that because his class was the sort of, I need another cartooning class and I can't just take Will Eisner. So, you know, yeah. I would say half of the students in his class didn't even know who he was. Oh, wow. So it was, it was a weird environment, you know, it was weird and, and, and kind of uh, listless, mm -hmm. maybe it would be a way of putting it. Mm -hmm. um, and the only reason I got anywhere with Harvey wasn't because I was a good student, because I, I wasn't. I, 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 I fulfilled my obligation, but just barely. I mean, I don't, I honestly, I don't remember a single assignment. Um, you know, it would be like, here's a topic, do a gag. And it was, yeah. it was, it was, it was weird and uninspiring. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Harvey saw my sketchbook like my personal sketchbook and he saw that I actually had something oh. and it went really on a dime. It went from being just another one of his <laughs> disappointing <laughs> uninspired students to him hiring me to work on nuts. It was, it was very odd. It was, and, 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 and as an editor, he was great. Like I learned a lot from yeah. him in an extracurricular capacity because that's where he was suddenly I was doing sequential stuff and he was pretty ruthless you know I still have all of the uh Xeroxes of his hand written notes on like make this better make that better and again I don't you know I look at the stuff and it's you know I'm 19 years old it's so I think it's pretty good for 19 I don't think it holds up now was he sick at the time when, like, what, could you, was he, he was pretty frail and stuff, or? Yeah, I, you know, obviously nobody really knew what it was. I'm sure he knew what it was, but certainly, what, one of my biggest regrets in life is, is not having taken him up on his generosity, because mm -hmm. he liked me. I mean, really, once we established that out-of-class relationship, mm -hmm. which was, of course, it was really exciting to me, because it was clandestine, too, because the whole thing was... Don't, you know, he was very adamant. Don't tell any of the other students we're doing this. Like, I don't want them to think, you know, there's favoritism. So, of course, again, that was one of the many things that went to my head as a 19-year-old made me think I was hot shit. So, you know, yeah. again, but what's the saying? Um, man makes plans and God laughs. You yeah, know, so, uh, 
but you know, I, I, I became, I'm sure I was already arrogant because I, 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 I would not want to have known me as a 19 year old. I'm sure I was horrible. I think we all were though. I was, I was pretty terrible too. I was terrible until like last year. Did um, you uh, grow up reading Mad Magazine? Yeah, of course. And Cracked? Did you read that, or did you think that no. was shit? <laughs> <laughs> no, Cracked was Cracked was really just what you occasionally would get if they were sold out of Mad. So of course mm-hmm. it it did not feel like much of a triumph in life that I worked for Cracked. The relationship between Cracked and Mad was particularly contentious. Wow, really? I didn't know that. Based on the 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 editor at the time. You know, he really was interested in in kind of, I won't say revitalizing, but vitalizing Cracked. Mm. And, you know, it was an interesting time because he was hiring all these new people like me mm-hmm. and Dan Klaus and Peter Bagg. And, you know, it was it was an interesting see that to me is like the more interesting graduating class than than Harvey's class, you know, because it was sort of the class of Cracked where it was, you know, for good or for ill, it was an interesting people, group of people. And you look at like, d- did anyone move on from that? And it's like, yeah, you know, Bill Ray was there at the time. And, you know, yeah. Bill is a luminary in animation and fine art. And, mm-hmm. you know, anyone who was who kind of stuck with comics, they're known, <laughs> to yeah. put it mildly. Mm-hmm. So, you know, working for them wasn't, didn't do much for my self-esteem because of course at the time you also don't see down the road but the editor definitely wanted to be a thorn in Mad's side so if you were part of that posse you were really held in 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 leery regard shall we say yeah so like the first one I think Maybe, I don't think too many people who worked for Cracked at that time did end up working for Mad, but the first, I think, to actually get to to, to cross over was Bill Ray, because Bill worked for Mad for like 10 years, and, you know, he, I think he did their first character-driven strip, um, Row. Yeah. yeah. That's great. And, a, and a, boy, I wish they would put out a book collecting all of those. That would be a really nice collection. Yeah, that was a great story. Um but you know, when when Bill started working for them, and I've been friends with Bill from before Cracked, mm-hmm. um, you know, it kind of was a, a beacon of hope. <laughs> like, yeah, oh, maybe yeah. someday uh, that stink won't be coming off me from having worked for for them. And you know, I I was even offered ten years probably. Whenever whenever Dave Berg uh, left this mortal coil. I was offered uh, at least an opportunity to take over the lighter side. Wow. And I just didn't want to do it. It, it, it just, it felt weird mm-hmm. and kind of, it, it didn't feel like a, a, an organic fit for what I do. Mm. Um, so I, I, I just never pursued it. I didn't say no, I just kind of let it languish mm-hmm. and felt weird about letting an opportunity to work for Mad go. And then fast forward however many years it was to when uh, Bill Morrison took over the reins and they were moving to California. And the first thing Bill did was he offered me the lighter side. I started writing some stuff because I thought I can't not work for Matt. I can't. I just can't. Yeah. Uh, But he and I went to dinner when he when I was still living in New York and he came into town and, and we went out to dinner. And Bill is one of the nicest human beings you will ever have the privilege to to encounter. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, I don't feel comfortable with the lighter side. Could I pitch something new? And he said, absolutely. And it was just like, oh, thank God. Yeah. So and it worked out very nicely. So, yeah, his mad his run on mad was great, too. Like, it's, it's such a shame because he was he really made it fresh, uh, but also kind of like he. He did throwbacks on stuff that should that that were just tasteful enough, you know. Like I remember when he the first issue that he took over, he, you know, he, they changed the logo to the original Mad mm-hmm. Comics logo. Yeah, he opened it up, and I think there was a photo of Harvey Kurtzman like on the first yeah page. To the best of my knowledge, sales actually did go up. Yeah, 
he certainly got a lot of press. I mean, you know, anytime you kind of, I mean, I, I even was leery about them starting with an issue number one again. Yeah. Uh, part of me wanted to be part of that continuity of, of you know, being an issue 500, whatever. Sure. But there was something very cool about also saying I'm in mad number one. I mean, that, that's, yeah. that, that, it, believe me, the cool part outweighed the other part. Yeah. Um, it was a corporate bullshit decision, though. It was just, it's like, it's, you could tell it's Warner Brothers. Tragedy is a strong word, but I think it is kind of a tragedy because Mad is at its best. It's a really important part of the national conversation. You know, it's 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 it always existed to be a satirical and and parodic uh, part of, and it's also just a part of of kids' development. It just is. I mean. Any any kid I would have ever wanted to hang out with also read Mad. You know, if the kid wasn't into Mad, it was like, okay, that's shorthand for I don't need to know you. So, <laughs> well, now it's like you know, uh, do, like would a kid even be interested in reading a magazine? Like it's it's just a totally different. But the thing is, it actually was. I mean, it didn't really. I don't think it ever kind of broke out of the demographic that they had hoped, which was to get more girls reading it. It has it has always been a very male skewing more mail. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, one of the heartbreaking things, I, I, I never went to um, the NCS before that, that National Cartoonist Society thing, but a friend of mine from New York was in town um, for it. So I drove, it was at Huntington Beach. So I drove, my geography is terrible. I don't know if it was up or down, wherever it was, I drove <laughs> to Huntington Beach. And um, and just as a sidebar, one of the thrills, I can say one of the absolute thrills of my life is the fact that when Sergio sees me now, it's with fraternity, you know, that I'll get a hug from 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 uh, uh, Sergio Aragones yeah. is amazing. Like that to me is, you know, check that off of a, a bucket list of things I never thought would happen, you know, um, one of my gods. But I went to um, that NCS thing and it was right after I found out that my services were no longer required, shall we say, in MAD. Hmm. And it was really, it felt really bad because, I don't know if you saw the strips I was doing, but I did, I was doing their first serialized strip. I mean, part of hmm. why I designed it that way yeah, was yeah. I was hoping to work longevity into it. Yeah, it's like, it. hey, if it says to be continued, they got to buy the next one, you know? <laughs> um, but again, life always has other plans. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I did four chapters of it and it was a, really, it was, it was so much fun to work on. And then they just were like, you're not guaranteed work. I don't know who said that, uh, you know, because basically I was kind of like, okay, here's the outline for chapter five. And they're kind of like, it was almost like, who do you think you are that you're guaranteed work? Oh, really? And I thought, oh, yeah. well, actually I was guaranteed work. That was part of, it was a verbal agreement, but yeah. you know, it was... It was an agreement, um, but That's really, when Bill left, when Bill was out, yeah, I, you know, I was Bill's boy. It's one of those things where it's like, if your association, anyway. But I was hoping, like, maybe, at least I get to wrap it up. You know, let me, let me be very meta about this mm -hmm. and make a slapdash ending for this thing that would actually be funny, kind of reference the fact that it's canceled, you know, like when TV shows get canceled yeah. and they've got 15 balls in the air and then they do this really rushed final episode. Yeah. I thought, let me at least do that and make it the worst final episode ever. No, didn't get to do that. Assholes. But, but the heartbreak part wasn't that, because that's just work. That's, you know, you roll with that. Mm -hmm. But this little girl oh, no. was at the convention with her dad. And, you know, she was maybe 12 and she was definitely, she, you, you could tell she was a little bit on the spectrum, mm -hmm. but a very sweet, that kind of kid that, you know, your heart goes out. She, uh, I forget who, who was behind the table, but I was with one of my other mad contributors to the section we were in and she recognized him first because he kind of, I'll just name names. Do you know Luke McGarry? Uh, no, I don't. No, I don't know. Look him up. He's a great cartoonist. Really funny. Really, he was doing great stuff for them. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, 
but she recognized him and she went right over. She's like, oh my God, you're, you're, you know, she was practically shaking in that way that just you, doesn't happen very often. Mm -hmm. And so she, you know, she got his autograph and then he very, cause I don't, I don't push myself forward, but he very graciously said, oh, you know, this is Bob Fingerman. And she got that look again, like oh. she, she said, Luki and Muki. Oh. And I, I was kind of like, yeah. So I did the thing and, and she said, I can't wait for the next one. Oh. And neither one of us could bring ourselves to say, well, <laughs> there won't be a next one. Sorry. And it was just kind of like, thank you so much. And I told her, I said, you know, Sergio's here. And then she got all, yeah. you know, wigged out about that. And when Luke and I were leaving the building, we saw Sergio and that girl, you know, the girl was just outside there with her dad. And I said to her, that's Sergio. And she just, again, it was kind of like, oh, and I said, you should go say hi to Sergio. He's very nice. And so off she went. And, and you know, it was one of these things where it's, it, it's, that's like the most gratifying thing, you know, it's as corny as it is. It's like, you don't meet that kind of really radiant sincerity very often, yeah. you know? And it's, it's, it really like Luke and I were both like, that was, you know, very special, but it also was like fucking assholes for know, canceling yeah. our strips. So wait, what happened to Sergio? Did he just retire from, from comics or something? He didn't, well, you know, to use the Blade Runner term, I think they would call it forced retirement. Yeah. Um, what are we working on now? Groove? I guess Sergio is, you know, Sergio's eternal. I, I, somebody somewhere is going to utilize Sergio. They have to. He's a force of nature. Are you, can you, like, allow yourself to pare your style down that much? Or you could just do something that looked like an old comic like that, like a BC comic strip or something, where it's just very simple line work with just like a few lines for the background. I like think I could. I, you know, there, that's the thing. That's the push-pull of, of well, like, my entire... Once I really began to get a little bit more comfortable with my own abilities, it was all about, like, the first... I would say the first part of my career was all about larding everything up with as much detail as possible because it was like I just want to impress everyone yeah, yeah. that I work really hard and that you know I don't do any cheats and it's all there and but really the work that I look at that gets me the most excited is where there's a certain spareness to it mm -hmm. like I still love all the draftsmanship mm -hmm. but like when it's just sort of more naturally just natural cartooning, pure natural cartooning. Yeah. One of the, to me, my my absolute favorite cartoonist, Sammy, I'm going to actually step and get the book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Denis Baudart, uh, this guy. Oh. It's just, yeah. Is one of the most incredible, hmm. just lively cartoonists I've ever seen. And I see the work he does now. Mm -hmm and it's become much more refined, it's still brilliant draftsmanship, but I don't feel that affinity for it. But like these two books, I look at them and I just think that's what I wanna be when I grow up. It's like somebody who, I mean, he also just has enormous facility for just natural draftsmanship. Like if it's a car, if it's a building, if nothing feels forced and it's in that kind of like, you can tell just everything just flows out super hmm. easy. Is it like he, will he draw every brick of a building or was he just- No, that's the whole point. It's like, it's all about the economy of it hmm. uh, where everything is essential. Like if you, I think if you took one line of what, kind of like a Hirschfeld when Hirschfeld was at the peak of his powers yeah take one line away and it's not that person's face anymore but there's so little to get so much that's kind of the way i look at this guy where it's like it's incredible like everything is just so balanced yeah but nothing is fussy there's not a fussy line to be found hmm. so you know if 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 i ever get where i'd like to be hmm. yeah it would be about it's more about indicating than depicting yeah. So, uh -huh. Like one of my, you know, the, the, the two collections uh, that I edited for Fantagraphics of Charles Rodriguez. Oh, it, yeah. That's right. Awesome. I forgot that you did that. Yeah. But like he's a guy who he could, he could, I don't know if this is 
I don't know if this is politically correct anymore, or, but, but there used to be the phrase Greeking in, you know, where you just kind of put it in mm -hmm. and it communicates without being all there. Yeah. It was mainly a type term, Greeking in, because they would just put in blocks to just fill later. Yeah. Um, but he, like in his gag cartoons, to go back to gag cartoons, he would do something where it's absolutely an urban street. It's a city. There's perspective. But you really realize it's just the kind of tops of the building going down a couple of floors and then nothing. Mm -hmm. But it's just enough to situate you. Yeah. That's what I wish for my own work is like just enough to situate you without bombarding you. Well, I mean, you know, and for me, it's like there's there's definitely been a very public uh, display of, of a kind of OCD that I've had with my work because it, 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 it is not consistent. You know, things evolve. You hope they're evolving. Some people might say devolving. I don't know. But like if you look at like the run of minimum wage, mm. it's like five different artists worked on it if you look at it stylistically because you know part of part of the genesis of minimum wage was rewarding myself for the misery of doing white like she you know white like she was everything was so precise and like any curve was with a french curve and you know it yeah, was yeah. Like, I, I there was just no spontaneity in mm. any of the art there maybe if there was a band flyer in the background i would actually draw that freehand but everything else was so it was like, okay, I can't, this is literally not sustainable. I will go mad if I try to do this again. Yeah, it was, so almost, it was, it was almost stenciled, that artwork. Yeah, it was, it, it, was an ex, it was a weird experiment. At least in that, I can say, because it was so unnatural, it actually is consistent from beginning to end, because yeah. I had locked myself into a rigidity. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like with minimum wage, I wanted it to feel more sketchbooky because that was always the stuff that felt like I'm not torturing myself. Like, let's do right. something that feels organic. Mm -hmm. And even there, like the first book, it starts really organic and then it begins to tighten up. And by the time it had gotten to the end of its Fantagraphics run, it again had gotten super precise. Uh, yeah. And I would have to go back in and retouch things for when it came out as a book because it's like, okay, he looks too different. Like, it, 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 it is such an exercise in trying to perfect something that can never be perfect. Yeah. Well, is that so, why you, you changed the art for Beg the Question? Like when you... Oh, yeah. I've changed it. Every iteration of that book that's in print <laughs> is different than the other. It's, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's a kind of madness. Um, you can't just that, let it go. But at this point, I'm now like, okay, you know what? Each story, the guy, because I started doing Dottie's Inferno in, I think, early 2016, mm -hmm. just finishing it now. It's an anthology. The stories are like in a certain order, but they do, she looks different from, you know, she, she, you would know she's the same person from story to story, but in one story, she's way cartoonier and fuck it. I give up. I can't. Yeah, I but can't exactly. just be the guy who makes it always look exactly the same. Yeah, I think it's better that way because it, it the eye registers it as like fun. Like you, like you can tell like when somebody's just kind of like loose and having a good time drawing. Yeah. Like well, people, people register that as like the artist is having fun here, and then then, then like they want to have fun. <laughs> they, like it's fun for them to look at it. If like, I so, hope so. Very I hope so. And you know, it's I mean, art's a pretty lofty word, but it is it's it's art, not product. Uh -huh. even though it ultimately is product because it's something people can buy. But when you're producing it, it's not product, you know? So, I mean, I, I've always kind of had, it's, it's, it's an admiration combined with befuddlement at people who you look at their work and it's like, it is so consistent from year to year. It's like they locked into a thing Mm -hmm. And you can show them, you can like, here's something this person did in 2010. Here's something they did in 1985. And it's like, it's exactly the same. How, how yeah. do you do that? Like that's the, one of the cool things about peanuts is you watch yeah. every area you pick up. It's like drawn different, you know? And that's, that's a joy for me. Yeah, it's absolutely. like, you know, I, and I, I really love every phase of it. Mm -hmm. It's like, the the very first strips which he really disparaged yeah. Oh, are yeah. gorgeous. 
yeah. just gorgeous. Everything in them mm. is just beautiful. Yeah. And then you look at the, you know, the slightly palsied hand at the end, still gorgeous. And yeah. it's, it's, well, minimum wage when it was coming out, do you remember like how much, cause it, it's, it was one of the top fanographics uh, comic books, right? The, at the time, I mean. Not really. It never really broke out um, for reasons that both myself and Gary could never really quite figure out. It never, like, we always thought it could, you know, do as well as hate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it never came close. I mean, not even remotely close. In retrospect, I, I lump it in with all those Fanographics books. Like I, I, I just assumed that it was a successful uh, comic, you know, out there. It was adjacent, and I mean, I think the thing is, it did well enough for it to keep going. You know, I pulled the plug; they didn't. Okay. Um, but uh, you know, but it never set the world on fire. I mean, it it certainly found its audience, but it never was a breakout. Do you remember um, the, the royalty checks what you would get from <laughs> They were significantly less cumulatively than minimum wage. So yeah, that was always, always the sad irony was, if anything, minimum wage was an aspirational title. <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> so, you you know. Like every six months or something, they would say, how did that work at, back then for like an actual, like, was it a monthly comic or? or no, no, I think I, I, I think at my best, I was probably putting out maybe three a year. Okay, yeah, that's still pretty good. And then were you able to live on the money, though, or not? No, 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 no. I was doing other work, too. I mean, that's the thing. I would, I, I would alternate doing an issue with that with doing stuff for, say, Penthouse Comics, you know. That was the thing. It's like, you know, again, you don't want to be, you don't want to be uh, gauche, but just to put things in context, when Penthouse Comics was coming out was when I was also doing minimum wage. Penthouse Comics paid $1,000 a page. God damn. Wow, in the 90s? And that's, and that's, yeah, so if you do the math of like, we're talking, exactly, we're talking like 1996 or so. Like $2,000 now by today's and money. I'm, exactly, and I'm doing a uh, four-page strip for them, mm -hmm. and that is monthly. Yeah. So that is where you can then do the minimum wage, you know, because yeah. it's like, okay, I made my nut doing that. Yeah. Now I can do this other thing that pays nothing. Um, you, were, you were getting a lot of illustration work as well at the same time, right? I mean, you get like records. Um, you know, intermittent, but, you know, again, that's where, you know, you, when you'd get the good gig, you say, oh, oh, great. But, you know, and again, before, like before I did White Like She, you know, I did, I did a, a uh, multi-issue run on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You know, there were things that they, they were the cash gigs. Yeah. And then, you know, the stuff that you save your soul with. Who was the publisher of the Ninja Turtles when you were doing it? That was Archie. That, they were like based off the toys more than the, uh, like in the animated series or something, right? Than the, the, actual, uh... the arc that I did was a weird one because stylistically, speaking of things changing from issue to issue, and that was deadlines that were a little brutal for me. Uh-huh. Because uh, that's when I was still, you know, trying to prove myself with all the detail. Uh, cause one issue I, I just, I was so falling behind. I had to have, uh, other people ink that one. So three of them were inked by me. One was inked by, uh, Stephen DiStefano and Kyle Baker, which Shit. is just weird. That's amazing. That's a great team. Um, <clears throat> for me, it was just a gig, you know, it was just a gig. I did some um, turtles too, man. Oh really? For IDW. Yeah. Oh, that, I'm sure that was much more fun. Yeah. Uh, it was, yeah. 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 Is good. Yeah, the ones the ones that I did by the end, you know, the joke I was making was by the end they were deeply middle aged because I I had given them bags under their eyes. They just looked worn out. By the time it was over, it was just like they had that look on their face of can we just please get on with our lives? It was <laughs> it was a pretty pretty rough run. Did they um, like that as a book ever? No, thank God. So what are you working on now that uh you, you finished this project? Um, well, there's still a little bit of a uh, little bit of housekeeping on Dottie. Um, it's been really fun working with them, actually, because they have fun and exciting ideas over there for drumming up interest. Mm. It's it's nice. I will say, l literally, in the literal sense of literally, in my entire career, I've never worked with any team that's as enthusiastic 
-hmm. which is really nice. I mean, it's, it's refreshing when you work with people who are palpably psyched. Yeah. I'm, I'm more used to jaded uh-huh. and used yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> or, so I'm, you know, it's, it's been a real, it's been a real pleasure actually. Um, but kind of coming up with and brainstorming things. So like this week I'm designing a t-shirt for uh, a pre-order incentive, like, you know, buy the book and t-shirt combo. And so, uh, so fun stuff like that, you know, but after that, I mean, cause the other thing is part of why I moved to Los Angeles was to be working in television. So, you know, I'm spending a lot of time working on, on pitches and, and things like that. So that's really yeah. a big part of, of where my creative energies is going is, is stuff more for that market. So, yeah. So you're, you're not, you don't have like a graphic novel or something that you want to do anymore? I mean, besides your Well, I, I would like to do more, more of the dotty stuff. So yeah, that's, that's really what I'd like to keep doing. Is it going to be a series? Dottie's Inferno is going to be. I hope so. I mean, then, yeah, and I've begun working on a pitch Bible for that. So, you know, that's, that's where you, you get into that world. All right. Well, retroactive apologies. It's nice virtually meeting you face to face uh, this way. And yeah, let's continue the conversation uh, privately. Cool, man. See you later. Thank you. Bye.